the American Revolution, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's one of the most mythologized wars. Somebody, a lot of you might study history, they take an interest in history, and I've talked to people like that, and they just don't understand what the heck happened, and they fall back on myths about, oh, jeez, yeah, the reason the Americans won is because the British stood out in the field and let the Americans hide behind trees and shoot them. <laughs> it's, but uh, it's a lot more sophisticated. But it, it's an interesting history, but it's also topical because what I try and illustrate is the American Revolution is the template for how you run a revolution. And, you know, before that, there's always been oppressed peoples before and after that were just so oppressed that they kind of spontaneously rose up against draconian powers. Like, you think of the French Revolution. But you're going to see the American Revolution was not quite anything like that, and there's been subsequent movements historically that uh, are the, kind of the same way, and they, they've tried to do it. And uh, the successful ones have pretty much followed the template set up by, by our leaders. So when you think of Revolutionary War, some of these faces come to mind. I'm sure you recognize some of the characters here, Simon Bolivar, and he was trying to be a revolutionary leader, uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, we'll talk about him at the end and his movement see how they compare to the original American patriots. But of all the revolutionaries in history, anybody got a guess who would you think is probably the most radical, crazy, out-of-the-box thinker of all time in this regard? I think it's like a tie for, tie for first between these two guys. You probably wouldn't think of it, you know, they seem kind of staid and, and uh, stoic, but these guys were nuts. <laughs> especially the one on the right, uh, Samuel Adams. Uh, he was a college-educated individual from Harvard University way back in the day. Kind of unsuccessful in business, but he was uh, very visionary. He had actually been a tax collector for the uh, Massachusetts colony. And uh, from an early age, he was agitating against the British in the 1740s. And he was uh, arguing that Parliament had no authority to tax Americans from a very early, early period in this. Revolutionary wars are different. You know, we studied World War II, you know, that, that's a big war, force on force, nation on nation with infrastructure and armies and navies and stuff. Revolutionary wars are different. Obviously, the government, in almost every case, is going to have a huge preponderance of power in all relevant categories you need to make war. From uh, the government's infrastructure, they've got tax structure, economic support, they usually have control of how to, how to uh, disseminate information, establish military forces and the logistic situation to keep them supplied, paid, medical support to them. All those things you need, generally one side has it and the revolutionary side doesn't. Revolutionary leaders, to get this thing going, they generally hold pretty radical views. Well, radical views are just what they mean. There's only generally a small percentage of a population that are radicals. So to get your vision, you know, we may be talking one or two percent of the population that's going to start this, that are really, really radical, but somehow you've got to get the entire or as much of the popular support of that, of that area in your camp, willing enough, so in your camp, they're willing enough to go risk their life and fight a war. So it's quite a challenge. Uh, to succeed, of course, you're going to have to expand your movement. Every revolutionary movement starts out really quite small. Ours was super small. And uh, a lot of times, you're going to have to re react or count on or try to precipitate your enemy doing, making some miscalculations and doing some, uh, doing some stupid things and even a lot of luck. So, in this case, we'll talk about the American Revolution, Americans. What is life like in British North American colonies? Well, in the 17th century Great Britain, there was really no money for colonial development. Uh, colonies had to cover their own costs. If you know anything about the original settlement, these companies would charter uh, 
their organizations and they would go to the colonies and they were all given royal charters and that's how they were set up. But they had to pay for that stuff. And the crown, they, they, they weren't offering any support. There was no money coming over to support them for building or military support or anything like that. So it was kind of out of, mind, out of sight, out of mind. And it, it, so it didn't take very long that the individual colonies would develop their own governments. It's like the Massachusetts legislature, everybody's heard of the House of Burgesses in Virginia, and they governed themselves, they taxed themselves, they provided their own security, and that's how things operated. So Britain liked it, liked to not uh, be, t be charged for any of the expenses of these colonies, but it works both ways because, uh, you know, the Americans are getting this real sense of independence already, in a way, because they're, they're self-governing, essentially. The northern colonies were more populous. And there's a big difference between the northern colonists and southern colonists. Northern colonists are what we think of when you think of Thanksgiving and immigration for settlement for different, different reasons, but mostly religious or, or uh, looking for a new life. Comparison, contrast to the south, it was people that went there with money and would, wanted to be exploitive of the land you know, grow products, be a resource uh, supply center for, for Great Britain, and that's the way they operated. So there's quite a, quite a difference. In the North, uh, in all these debates that led up to the war, there was a guy named Edmund Burke that kind of paraphrased the character of those Northern colonists, probably better than anybody I ever read. And, and I'll just paraphrase it. He said in his speech to Parliament, essentially, you know, He's speaking to all his fellow parliamentarians, he said, you know, about 100 years ago or so, we had our own civil war here, you know, the English Civil War. And as a result of that, all these rights to Englishmen were granted, and Great Britain, England, is without doubt, in comparison to any other nation on the world, we are the freest nation on earth. He said, but these people that went to, especially New England, they're so crazy. The freest nation on earth wasn't free enough for them. <laughs> when you think about the pilgrims and the Puritans, it, it wasn't free enough for them. So they, they get up. I mean, think about what it would take for you to get on a rickety ship, cross the Atlantic Ocean with your family to go to a wilderness. I mean, this is pretty high-risk stuff. So it meant a lot to them, this freedom that was the promise of America. And that's the character, particularly of New Englanders, that uh, was at the root kind of of all these disengagements that they were having between them and the mother country. Uh, so the, go the colonies governed themselves for over 100 years. Very little interference. You'd have a royal governor, but it was really kind of one of the easiest jobs on earth. It was an appointed job. He didn't have that much to do. The, the legislatures of each colony ran stuff. Um, most Americans were farmers or tradesmen. By 1770, around 70% were literate. And that's really concentrated in the northern colonies. Uh, it declined in the middle colonies and really declined in the south. There was a lot of, there was a lot of lawyers in America, especially up, up north. <laughs> 17th century Americans were mostly isolated in small villages. They got their news from almanacs and sermons and proclamations. Uh, by 1760, there were some weekly news publications. But the big thing that's surprising in all this is by the 1750s, the American standard of living was amongst, some said, the best in the world. If you were an American living in one of those coastal colonies, you had the highest standard of living in the world. So, you know, there's an old saying that uh, nobody starts a revolution with two loaves of bread uh, under their arms. But in this case, they are. And uh, that's what's kind of curious about the whole thing. Well, things start really kind of, you know, the turning point of, of American history at that stage really takes place with this uh, issue of... What happened to my slide, Jefferson? One of my slides is missing, but uh, I guess it's an old uh, order. One of the things that uh, 
You know, we, if I said to you, what was the cause of the, the people being against the British government? And you'd say, taxation without representation. Which, yeah, that, uh, of course, played a big part. But there's also a lot of propagandizing in all of this. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that really was starting to take place, Americans, you know, New Englanders and Americans in, in general are kind of innovative. One of the things they started to observe as the 1760s rolled out is this dawn of a new era. Some Americans, a few Americans, were very, very adept at noticing and seeing if what for it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now you, you think of it in the 19th century, but really, production and industrialization really started now. And uh, that's going to be very interesting, because if, if you're a visionary, you can see there's going to be a lot of money to be made in the, in coming up. This is going to change everything. British economic policy, though, cut the American colonies out. They practiced a, a system called mercantilism. They were attempting to run a trade surplus with their own colonies so that they could accumulate gold reserves. American colonies were viewed as just suppliers of raw material, resource providers. And uh, then they would be markets for the British goods that were manufactured. So the British get it going both ways. They get the raw materials, they get full employment, because they're going to be manufacturing stuff and they're going to send it right back to the originators and sell it to them. So Americans are prohibited from engaging in manufacturing or in limited shipbuilding and all those kind of things which they were interested in doing. Even to the extent that Great Britain, uh, they actually restricted the amount of trade that the colonies could do with each other, which, uh, you know, that'll get you kind of angry. So, you could see uh, taxation is going to be, of course, an important issue for the American people, but who's going to benefit most if Americans can break this policy of mercantilism? Who's going to be the people that are initially going to be benefit the most? Pardon me? Rich America. Yeah, the richer leader, economic leaders of America. They're the ones with the capital that are going to create manufacturing processes. But do you think you could rally a nation of people by saying, all right, all right. <laughs> you have to be like super Republicans, you know. All right, we're going to create a revolution so that uh, we can create this enterprise. I'm going to get rich and uh, own General Motors. But, <laughs> but the fact is, was it, wasn't there freedom being denied? I mean, these people are being denied the opportunity to create wealth for themselves. And the right of a British citizen is you should be able to do that. So it's a legitimate grievance. But how many people does that, what percentage of the people does that represent, would you guess? I don't know, a couple. Yeah. So somehow that little group is going to have to get popular support enough you're going to take on the global superpower. That's going to be tough. So it's going to take a lot of information operations, and they're going to key in on this taxation issue. And don't forget, I already said it, it's kind of, they were kind of predisposed, especially New Englanders, to a little bit of separate thinking anyway. So the seeds were there. Father Chris, you got a, you got a question? Yeah. How did they That's the rule. I don't know how much it was challenged. Especially Southern colonies, they were more than happy to send their goods to Great Britain because those big plantation owners and stuff were doing quite well. Okay. So, yeah, if it needed to get enforced, it probably would have, but I don't think it was a problem for them in the 18th century yet. They couldn't trade to even the Caribbean either, which was a huge resource for Great Britain, but Americans were not allowed to go down and trade in the Caribbean. What was the, the British's purpose? Well, they're getting rich. They got full employment from all the manufacturing. Everything's going through them, and then they just sell it back to us. So it's a big economic boom for them. 
the Seven Years' War is kind of when, when all this stuff starts to, it's kind of the, mar, the benchmark when things start to change. Of course, everybody knows, should know, it's the, the uh, French and Indian War, is what we know it as, and fought between 1756 to uh, 63. Roughly 20,000 Americans fought in that, mostly in the Northeast, upstate New York, and some New Englanders. And uh, it is a huge global war. It's re really World War I, actually. But uh, of particular importance, Great Britain wins. They win big. It was Great Britain, basically, as the slide said before, it wasn't just France. You think of it just French and Indian, but they also were at war with Spain concurrently. And they beat them both, and they make out like bandits. Uh, some of the... They get uh, a lot of the Caribbean, the French, the French Caribbean islands, which is sugar-producing islands. Excuse me, back in those days, sugar was like crack cocaine. <laughs> People couldn't get enough of it. And uh, they also, yeah. <laughs> so they get all the French Empire in North America, which was essentially Canada. Uh, the French and the British had been competing for control of India and essentially the British now dominated India. The French were out, which of course is uh, going to be huge for them in the future. And from the Spanish, the British gained Florida. Uh, and Great Britain receives an indemnity from both of them, which is basically cash payments. So this argument that the British come up with that, oh, uh, we need money for your protection, seems to me kind of specious. Because... Think about it. They just took over all the area from the Adirondack Appalachian Mountain chain out to the Mississippi River, essentially. And uh, they get a lot of money. They get the Caribbean. They get India. And now they're crying broke. And Americans have to pay taxes. So again, 20,000 Americans fighting the war. Uh, a lot of them believe, hey, I'm entitled to benefit from this victory, and a lot of them want to expand westward. Back in those days, uh, 1760s, there was about 1.6 million Americans. A quarter of them are slaves. But Great Britain uh, and immediately announces after the French and Indian War, first of all, no westward expansion. Well, how can they say that? Who's that land belong to? The Indians. Huh? To the Indians. No. <laughs> it belongs to the king. The king owns it, yes. It's the king's. So, you know, it kind of makes me mad, like, oh, the British government, we're broke. Uh, you know, we need, you to, we need to tax you guys. Well, your highness, why don't you sell Ohio? <laughs> to a couple of, you know, rich guys over there, and you'll have some, some you know, pocket money. But <laughs> it's, it's absurd, really. Maybe they didn't have a lot of liquid cash, but they could get it. So the taxation thing uh, is, is, was a terrible argument, and you wonder really why they did it. There had been in place uh, a tax that was never enforced called the Revenue Act. And in 1763, at the end of the war, that's the first time that the British tax Americans. And it's really a tax that's been on the books. They just started to enforce it. Americans, led by Sam Adams, uh, immediately start to push back. This was a tax on sugar products. Uh, and it didn't take them long to remove the tax. Uh, the stupid thing, and here's the thing about how ornery these, these protesters of the tax were. It reduced, it actually reduced the cost to an American of molasses uh, from six pence to three pence. But it was just a tax to a, basically they looked at it as an outside government entity, the British government, and they protested it. So they were, <laughs> now you gotta start to think, somebody's orchestrating these, uh, these protests because if you tell the average guy, hey, I'm gonna reduce your, you're gonna pay taxes to Great Britain, but the cost of your molasses is gonna go down. How many people are going to go, wait, no, <laughs> what are you, crazy? But that, they, start, they start to protest. 
Now, obviously, in my opinion at least, it's pretty obvious the average American is not coming up with this idea. Like, oh, I'm against this. They look, they're, they're for saving money. But uh, somehow, through some information operations and whatever else is going on, the people that are opposing British control are starting to mani manipulate the people to oppose any taxation from the mother country. Americans didn't want to acknowledge Parliament's authority to tax them. But the Revenue Act gets wiped out pretty quick. But uh, they're still determined, Parliament, to, uh, to uh, assert their power, so they passed the Stamp Act in 1765. And that was a tax on any paper product, a wide range of items from legal documents, marriage licenses, common items such as a deck of cards. It's kind of an onerous tax because you had to go to the, sta the stamp tax office and, and take care of paperwork and so forth, but uh, it wasn't very expensive, but what's Americans' reaction to that? Not happy. Not happy. All Americans, do you think? Just the ones that have to pay the tax. Ones that had to pay the tax, but this is not an onerous tax. It's not like uh, uh, you really, it's going to really put a hurt on your household budget or anything, but there's going to be pushback. There's going to be some pushback by Americans. And it leads to the introduction of a group starting in Boston and New England, the Sons of Liberty. And their leader was a guy named Sam Adams. Who are these Sons of Liberty? Anybody know American history back to that day? Who were these guys? Anybody got any background on that? Very interesting here because it's led by Sam Adams. The Stamp Act is a watershed event because opposition to the British government is now, is now becoming, it becomes violent. Government, governing officials that are supposed to be seeing that the law is carried out start to be harassed. And uh, there's, there's a number of tarring and featherings uh, in Boston around New England. Anybody know what tarring and feathering is? I mean, think about that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you got to take molten tar, and then you, you know, they, they rip off the clothes on a guy and, and then throw molten tar. How hot is molten tar? So you're going to get, what, third-degree burns probably all over your body, and then they do the additional favor. They go down to the market and sweep up off the deck with all the chicken poop and everything else. Feathers, and then they throw that all over you. So you got third degree burns all over yourself that are, that are gonna get infected. So you, you, you have a pretty good chance of not making it through that. And these are royal officials that they're going after. So who are these rebels again, back to that point? The Sons of Liberty were first formed in the summer of 1765. The group was originally known as the Loyal Nine. They were organized by Sam Adams, and they were nine Boston shopkeepers and artisans. So some people with a couple of bucks. But that was it. It was just nine of them. Uh, in August of 1765, they acquired the help of a guy named Ebenezer McIntosh, who was a, a local cord wainer or a shoemaker, and he was the leader of South the South End, South Boston's Pope's Day Company. The Pope's Day was the day that all the uh, uh, New Englanders would run around and they had groups, there was clubs, that would compete for demonstrating how much they hated the Pope. This is like Guy Fawkes Day, if you know what that is. And, uh, you know, they were hell raisers. They were a bunch of rabble-rousing nuts. And uh, this guy, Ebenezer McIntosh, he was a company commander for about a mob of roughly 3,000. And these are not like the cream of the crop of, of Boston society. <laughs> these are guy rope makers and, and all kinds of rabble that like to go out and they, uh, they'd get into kind of mob uh, gang fights with the North Enders. And this is a rough bunch. These guys aren't really concerned, I'm sure, about stamp taxes or anything else, but Ebenezer McIntosh controls them. These are the original Sons of Liberty. It's not a bunch of guys reading poetry under the Liberty Tree. It's a bunch of guys as depicted in the picture that are just nasty brutes. 
that are being doing what they're told. These are not spontaneous actions of, of a bunch of uh, freedom-loving Americans. Loyal Nine uh, led the Sons of Liberty, and first activities, they led a destructive, in 1766, they led a destructive wild riot. Uh, they invaded the home of a soon-to-be stamp collector, Andrew Oliver, and they tarred and feathered him, drug him around town. I think the guy survived, but uh, probably had a pretty lousy quality of life uh, for the rest of it. 30 minutes, they destroyed the stamp office he had built, used the timbers for a bonfire. Uh, they hung an eff effigy of a Andrew Oliver and a, and a boot that represented the British men of power. There's a lot, the Sons of Liberty were responsible for many more violent anti-British acts over the next several years. Uh, and, you know, the Stamp Act never even got into effect. It was rescinded, actually, before it got into, uh, got into full practice. Now, this is the siege of the American Revolution, but think about it. Most Bostonians are not, you know, from the, that 3,000-man mob. If you're an average family man living in Boston, you're a tradesman or you're a shopkeeper or whatever, when you're seeing, uh, and, and people haven't changed, it, it guys like us, you see somebody that you probably know, uh, Oliver in this case, who was a citizen of Boston for his whole life, get drug out, tarred and feathered, what, do, what would you think about that? You're a little scared. <laughs> you're a little scared, but I mean, is that going to make you say, I want to be a patriot too? I want to rebel against the British government. I'm with these guys. So why, why do you think they did it? What, what's, what is Sam Adams and these, these uh, revolutionaries, what, but specifically Sam and the Gang of Nine or whatever you want to label them, what are they thinking? What are, what are they trying to accomplish by these brutish acts? <laughs> Probably. I don't know that for a fact, but these guys, they, they enjoyed it anyway because they're, they're, they're rabble. Hey, go have a, go tire a feather this guy and beat him up and grab stuff out of his house in the new, in the new tax office. So, sure, why not? <laughs> what do you think, Paul? Well, you think they're trying to intimidate the, the population? That's true. That's true, but you got to you got to grow this movement, right? You got to get it. You got to get your your movement to grow. You're nine guys and three thousand rabble rousers. You know, that's the, that's the point of having the thing. He said it sounds like Antifa, and uh, that's kind of the point of this discussion today. It's like it, it is like Antifa, but what are they trying to really do? They're trying to get the government to do something uh, retaliatory and create. Victims. So they're trying to make the English government mad and they will overreact. Exactly. They want the British government to do something that then they can use with propaganda or information ops to go, look, look what they did. And uh, we'll see how it works. They got rid of the Stamp Act, but then uh, within a year or so, they put in the Townsend Act. And this time the British government's like, they're smart, right? We learned from the last time, last time we introduced a tax, you know, poor Oliver and all the tax collectors got tarred and feathered. So as, as part of our act here, we're, uh, we're going to introduce forces in America to maintain security. It, the Townsend Act caused a lot of trouble. It proposed fees on glass, Paper, pasteboard, uh, paper supplies, tea. And the, the Brits had learned their lesson from the last one. So this time, they accompany the new tax law with British troops in Boston. They send armed forces to Boston. Two regiments, 4,000 troopers. Doesn't sound like much, but the population of Boston in 1768 was roughly 15,000. So now 20, almost over 25% of the people running around Boston are going to be British soldiers. So 
there's no, uh, there's no existing barracks or camps for these troopers to go to, so where are they gonna, where are they gonna stay? Yeah, they quartered them or billeted them in the people's houses. So again, put yourself in the shoes of a Bostonian father of uh, three or four young girls and maybe a, a couple of boys and your pretty wife there living in a nice home in Boston. All of a sudden, here comes, they're going to quarter two British soldiers in your house. Uh, are these nice guys? <laughs> Yeah, this is going to really, really heighten temp, uh, tensions. Generally, there's two soldiers to a house. These British soldiers are generally guys that avoided prison or, you know, the dregs of, of British society, pretty much. They were huge consumers of both large quantities of rum and prostitutes. And think about it. Not only uh, are you the father of these, you're probably a pretty devoutly religious person living in Boston in those days. You have your family there, and uh, now the British government says, okay, you're going to quarter these two, these two uh, characters in your house. These activities, rum and prostitutes, that's an anathema to the Puritan population of Boston. They had to provide them with food and lodging, as well as soap and water for consumption and bathing. And where did they get in your house in Boston? Where did you get your water? Had to go down to the well, down the probably down the corner or down a little square. So you got to provide an extra couple of adults hot water a couple of times a week. You had to feed them. You had to give them soap. This is all big, huge imp imposition. And that's one of the, it pops up in the, when we write the Declaration of Independence is one of the major grievances is they quartered troops in our homes. So this has now changed from a, political legal debate in Boston where people are wondering, how can I support these patriots with the tyrant and feathering and stuff? And now it's an emotional tempest because think about yourself in that position. Uh, you've, you've observed all the, the tyrant and feathering and the opposition to the taxes and stuff, which you probably kind of agreed with. You didn't like the tactics of taking out old Mr. Oliver and tyrant and feathering, but you probably didn't like the tax either. You weren't ready to go to war over it. But now all of a sudden, the government just put two soldiers in your house and they're running around the city, pretty much uh, you know, show, a show of power. How, how are you feeling now towards this patriot movement? You think we're growing the movement a little bit? Yeah, yeah, we're growing this movement. This tactic, and it, it just shows sometimes uh, if the revolutionaries, you're gonna have to take a beating sometimes, because they're gonna to start to point to, they're gonna to have to use things like this that, that people would be opposed to, and they're gonna to have to use information ops propaganda to really kinda of demonstrate the unjustness of it. The, uh, the table was set. When you introduce troops, even in a peaceful setting or for security, but you've introduced two troops. I like the Shakespeare observation, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Because now, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. When you got 4,000 troops running around a city with, with 15,000 people that hate them, uh, there's potential for a lot of problems that you're going to lose total control over. And guess what's going to happen? Too, what's that? Weren't there loyalists? Of course, yeah, but Boston really was not that many to begin with. There, there always were, and the further south they went, the more loyalists there were. But uh, let's flip the dogs of war. Well, let's see what's going to happen after a couple of years of, uh, of them. But I guess before we go on, let me uh, remind us from our original uh, lecture last, last time on Midway, our old uh, friend Carl von Clausewitz and his famous quote, war is a continuation of political activity by other means. The political object is the goal. And in this setting... I bring it up because, all right, the British government wants to establish closer ties and, and, uh, and renew the loyalty and affection between the American colonists and their own government. Do you think this tactic or strategy of introducing military force to create goodwill 
And loyalty is, is a good uh, strategy and policy match. You know, if the policy is to get us all closer and have cooperative efforts, is introducing draconian methods like military force the best tactic? You know, again, I would uh, clearly argue not. Anyway, yeah, introduction of troops is going to create huge levels of tension. It erupts March 5th, 1770, uh, in a it, situation called the Boston Massacre. March 5th, 1770. And uh, think about New England weather. Still, it's getting into the early, late stages of winter. There's snow on the ground, but it's probably crusty, icy snow. And there's a sentry out on his post near the, uh, the Capitol building in Boston. And a uh, bunch of kids throwing snowballs at him. But they're ice balls, you know, they're not fluffy little. <laughs> and a lot of them, were, you know, the kids were nasty, they put rocks in him. And uh, the sentry is kind of under duress, under duress. And so he called, there's, a, he, he, actually, I, from, there's a lot of different stories about what happened, but from what, one of the ones I like the best, uh, some, they were harassing the guard, and he kind of, poof, knocked the kid over with his rifle butt or something. And he ran off to the pub, and everybody's in there pounding beers, and he says, that lobster buck, uh, you know, knocked me on my butt. And they said, they can't do that. Whatever happened, this mob turns out into the square and starts to challenge this sentry, who's just a young kid. He calls for his comrades. So they come, they come running out. And now the mob, mostly drunken, uh, drunken mob, but I guarantee you, they're from that 3,000 of Ebenezer McIntosh's group. Because this is all, you know, if you read between the lines, this has got to be staged. Because there's, there's all kinds of rocks and bricks out there. There's clubs with nails coming out of the, the top of it. There's all kinds of stuff to, uh, to facilitate their, uh, their violence. Anyway, they start to throw uh, objects at the soldiers. They're grabbing up clubs that are conveniently lying around the area. Uh, the troops feel threatened. And there's other stories about how it all happens, but ultimately, shots are fired. Uh, ultimately, these troopers were uh, tried for murder and surprisingly, defended by a famous Massachusetts lawyer from my old hometown, Braintree, uh, John Adams. He defended them in a Massachusetts court and got them acquitted. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, despite the fact that it's acknowledged by a Boston jury as kind of a mob violent action and the troopers got off the hooks, uh, it's, it's mythologized or it's propagandized in this poster that gets circulated throughout the entire 13 colonies. The Bloody Massacre. Uh, Sons of Liberty use this to the, uh, is the uttermost is, uh, in, for propaganda poster uh, pro, uh, purposes. You can see this writing down here. It's a poem they wrote to kind of describe the situation. I'll read you the first, uh, the first stanza on the, on the left side. It said, uh, Unhappy Boston, see thy sons deplore, thy hallowed walks besmeared with guiltless gore, while faithless Preston, that's the British captain, while B faithless Preston and his savage bands with murderous rancor stretched their bloody hands like fierce barbarians grinning o'er their prey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're in Pennsylvania or Virginia or elsewhere, uh, you know, uh, you don't know any better. You probably never got the news, probably, you know, controlled the information. You probably never got the news later that they were exonerated. You, all you heard of was the Boston Massacre. So, again, now we're trying to grow our movement. How are we doing? You know, one of the things I like to point out, too, it's so interesting. It, it looks like it's broad daylight. But it was nighttime. It was, it was quite late, actually. Uh, these were the people that were in this riot, or whatever you would label it, the mob, were really a bunch of unruly, you know, mobsters. And, uh, but these guys, they look like they're going home from church or something, <laughs> right? You got little kids out here. Uh, you got puppies. 
Like, we were just going about our business, and these guys just pulled rifle on, you know, guns on us and started blasting us. And it couldn't really be further from the truth, but that's what the colonies see. So how are we doing on, on growing our movement? We've got troops quartered in our houses, which really, really pissed us off. Now, depends on who you believe, but looks like now they're just, they're just killing us. So at least for New Englanders who are really feeling the brunt of this stuff, how are we doing on growing our movement? Yeah, we're getting well past the 3,000 uh, mobsters, for lack of a better word. We're, we're really growing this in the general public now to some significant support for our, indep our independence movement. Things don't really settle down. Tensions remain, but there's, and there's tars and tarring and featherings and all kinds of activities, but the next big event uh, takes place a couple of years later, December 1773, the famous Boston Tea Party. They had pretty much taken all the taxes off, off uh, Americans except for the tax on tea, but these people were so determined to upset the apple cart against British governance that Sons of Liberty once again stirs the public up, excuse me, about the, the tax on tea, and they go down, of course, to the harbor and throw it all in there. Well, if you want to piss off British, the British, <laughs> throw away their tea. <laughs> so the, the parliament and the king really has a strong reaction to this. They're outraged and they pass what becomes known in America as the Coercive Acts. Americans call them the Intolerable Acts, actually. They pass by parliament as punishment for the Boston Tea Party. They close the port of Boston. Now, keep in mind, this has been a colony in existence since like 16, uh, the original Pilgrim 1620, but th th there was a big influx of settlers in the 1620s. And essentially, uh, the Massachusetts legislature had been in, in, in place, I think, I think it was like 1630. They've been self-governing for 130 or 40 years. So abolishing the Massachusetts legislature, as far as a Massachusetts person was concerned, that's our government, really. That's our principal primary government. Uh, this constitutes political and economic warfare, really. So the people of Boston experienced se severe depredations as a result. So again, back to uh, the original point of how you start revolutions. Those actions taken by the mob to precipitate British overreactions has now developed a huge movement in, in New England against British, against British control. All uh, commerce in the outside world is shut down. Communications with other colonies is shut off. Essentially, Boston is an occupied, occupied city under martial law. Now, the rest of the colonies outside of New England are starting to get alarmed themselves. So they decide through their correspondence to hold a Congress. The first Continental Congress meets in, uh, I got July up there, but that's a, it's a mistake. It's actually September. The principal aim is to protest the intolerable acts. So everybody goes down to Philadelphia. Remember, these are like the leading citizens from each colony. They don't really know each other at all. Uh, pretty much they're wealthy leaders of, of their communities and so forth. And they put them in, uh, they meet for the first time in Philadelphia. So how do you think that's going to go? What, what's the environment they're going to be like? I mean, Of course, you think these guys have any egos? <laughs> yeah, I think they, you know, you got some huge egos from every colony in, a, in one room, and they're all trying to outdo each other, and it's, it's kind of chaotic. Um, but, you know, they, they're, trying, they're trying their best. You see guys praying and stuff, you know. It's, uh, they're, they're serious people, and they consider themselves serious people that should be respected. But as far as... Uh, in a legal sense, to the king or parliament, is this a legal organization? Is there anything they recognize? So what they decide to do after several weeks of debate is write a letter to the king and parliament 
basically trying to state their case. And uh, so it takes several weeks. By It's like the end of October, I think. They send the letter off. How long does it take to get to Great Britain in, in the fall? Prevailing winds, probably not too bad. Uh, five weeks, four or five weeks to get over there. And then uh, what's the king going to do when he gets this letter? What's his first reaction going to be like? Yeah, Continental Congress. I didn't say they could have a Continental Congress. Who are these people? Yeah, they probably he took it to the privy and used it for, you know, some other purpose. Well, I, I doubt that he even read it. And neither did, uh, yeah, neither did uh, his prime minister, Lord North. It's King George III. He's a, uh, looks like he's going to the prom, I guess, you know. <laughs> All dressed up. He's having a very good day. Uh, but he's not going to read this. He doesn't recognize a Continental Congress. You know, commoners don't address royalty with letters and stuff like, like this. This is, a, this is not how things work. But Americans are kind of unused to the, the royal trappings anymore. So they're expecting a serious response. They think we're serious people. We expect to be treated with some respect, and uh, they don't get it. In retaliation, the king and the prime minister, they decided to punish and weaken them even more, all the colonies. They blocked access to, to fishing areas and disregarded the requests that Congress had made. So that was the, uh, in 1774, end of 1774. By the time the Americans figured out, he's not even going to write us back. They're not even going to respond. It's probably getting into spring 1775. So there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of hatred growing. New England's really already a, a cauldron of, of hatred, and, uh, and they're fatigued with this military occupation, and things are about to go real wrong. April 19th, 1775. British force of 700 men leaves Boston to go to Concord, Massachusetts, to seize and destroy some arms and ammunition. It's a long night for them. You know, back in the day on colonial roads, an armed force, if they could move 15 miles, that would be, that'd be, a, big, uh, that'd be a big troop movement. So they got quite a ways to go. Um, the countryside's been alarmed. Actually, Le Lexington's about 11 miles, and... Uh, Concord's about five or six more miles. But they finally make it, they, and it's an all-night march. Pretty much they leave pre-dawn, and they get, to, uh, they get to Lexington fairly early. So these guys have been up all night marching, the British, pretty tired. They get to Lexington, 11 miles northwest of Boston, and Major Pitcairn, the leader of this detachment of the main British force, runs into a militia company led by a guy named John Parker. They're on the Village Green. They had no intention of resistance nor attack. They just wanted to show that they were kind of determined and displeased at the royal incursion out into the countryside. Um, nobody really knows who fired the first shot. Um, the first uh, organized volley was fired by Pitcairn's troops, and several colonists were killed, and others were wounded before they fell back. The British suffered no casualties, and Pitcairn dispersed the rabble and joined the main force and proceeded to Concord. What's cool in Boston, uh, that's a state holiday. I don't know why it's not a national holiday, but it's a state holiday, so we all got it off from school when we were kids. That's the day they run the Boston Marathon. And if you didn't know, the marathon, as closely as they can, traces the route the British ran back to Boston. <laughs> So they get to Concord, and uh, there's a bridge they had to cross to get into the town where they, they thought that they were going to grab up some American rebel leaders and some ammunition and stuff. They had to cross the bridge, but there was uh, several militias organized there, and they stood their ground and fired back. They fought in a fairly organized manner uh, and, and drove the British back. As the British started to withdraw, 
more militias that are coming from the countryside around there start to rally to the area. So the British are harassed essentially all the way back to Boston. And they, they suffered some pretty severe casualties as a percentage of the, of the force. <clears throat> this is where, <coughs> I get choked up on this one. <laughs> this is where they stood their ground and forced the British to retreat. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flags to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Well, the British fell back, heavy casualties, and they make their way back all the way into the city of Boston again. I was talking to uh, Doug L before, because he's a, you know, he did college time and a lot of time up in Boston. It doesn't look like that anymore, but that's what Boston used to look like back in the day. And you can see uh, there's a really narrow neck, and this is the city out here. Uh, so it's kind of easy to bottle up a, a force in there, because the only way out on land is through this narrow neck. Uh, British did have naval power and plenty of boats, but to cross land, it's, it's easy to kind of hem them in. But in June, you know, the, the original fight was April 19th. It's now June 1775, and the tactical situation is militia units are around the city hemming in the British, who were pretty much all in the city. The British look up one day in June 1775 and notice over here on a hill, it's actually called Breed's Hill, there's a bunch of Americans up there digging trenches and looking like they want to put some artillery or something up there. So the Brits, not being stupid, go, <laughs> that could be bad. And uh, they decide we better do something about that before they get some artillery up there because the whole British fleet is sitting in the harbor and would be prime targets. So they decide, let's put a force together and we're going to go kick them off that hill. It becomes known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. Breed's Hill, forever now known as Bunker Hill, which was a, a nearby hill, actually. But uh, the Americans were on the high ground and dug in. You know, Americans were not experienced, not experienced soldiers, but most of them were what? Farmers. Farmers were pretty good at digging, <laughs> digging ditches, <laughs> and they, they made some excellent defensive fortifications on the top of this hill. Uh, so they're entrenched up there, and the British decide, well, it's just rabble. We can easily drive them off. But, uh, so they, they, they really don't do anything too sophisticated. They just go in with some blunt uh, force trauma kind of frontal assaults. And that doesn't work out too good for them. The Americans are pretty good marksmen. There's advantages in, if you're into weapons, you probably know if you're firing downhill, it's, it's much easier to be uh, accurate with your fires than, than firing uphill. Firing uphill people tend to overshoot. Besides muskets, I don't know if you know much about weaponry, but those old muskets weren't very, uh, weren't very accurate, especially the military style. The Americans are fighting more with long, longer musket rifle barrels, but they're not rifles, you know, so I misstated that. But uh, American muskets were a little more accurate because the barrels were longer, so they're pretty deadly accurate. So it's a ta eventually, though, the Americans run out of ammunition, so they scoot. We take some casualties, but really, really put a huge uh, hit on the British attacking force. So it becomes a tactical victory for the British. They won the hill, but a huge cost. Now, when the word gets to Philadelphia, because the Second Continental, Con Continental Congress is in session, word gets to... Uh, Word gets to con Congress, and they decide, you know, we need to do something about this. It's getting out of control. The, America, the military, uh, the Massachusetts militia really is, is handling this entire military operation. And that's not fair to New Englanders, because this is all of our cause. So following Bunker Hill, Congress authorized an American Continental Army. And they uh, request one of their members, General uh, George Washington, to take over and uh, command it. Washington's an interesting guy. He's one of the wealthiest men in America. He's got combat experience in the French and Indian War. He was a junior officer with, with the you know, American forces, with the British. 
He's an autocratic, highly disciplined individual. Um, but he's going to learn, you know, his vision, his whole life, he wanted to be a British military officer. And that's what was his mindset. But, he, you know, one of the brilliant things about Washington is he is going to uh, learn in his first year his methods and his way of thinking is not going to work with this American army. It's an interesting picture. Do you think, you really think that's what the American army looked, looked like when uh, Washington took over? <laughs> now, well, as we were talking, you know, revolutionary movements, they don't have that infrastructure. There's no uniforms, there's no uniform weapons, artillery, all that stuff. You know, it's just pick up what you can, what you can find. So now we're getting into 1775, 1776. And here's an important slide. In 1776, the demographics, if you will, the relating to the structure of the population, when it came to the question of American independence, it was approximately by 76, 2.6 million Americans. And at the time of the Declaration of Independence, they were roughly divided into thirds on that issue. One third were loyalists. The loyalist uh, centers you can see are in red. Uh, the area around New York City, the Mohawk Valley up in upper, upper state New York, Philadelphia area, and you can see in the south, pretty much the urban areas are the, the uh, loyalist centers. There's a third that are really a, could care less one way or the other. New Jersey's a famous uh, kind of neutral area. And there's one third for independence. So, if you think about it, we're getting ready for a real, no kidding, fighting war. And uh, what's Washington's hope with only one third of the population even supporting him? He's to have to, he has to overcome the British military forces. You know the British are going to recruit loyalist forces. And what, what's his hope of victory against, you know, a force like that? Pretty much no chance. So he's still got to grow in the midst of conflict. Americans are still going to have to grow this conflict. You know, so these glorious pictures of, of, uh, that we're going to see of, of Rara Siskumba, you know, independence, you know, is a legal thing. It doesn't even represent the majority wish of Americans at that point. And uh, how are they going to win? This is, this is going to be very interesting. How, how are we going to pull this off? It does help in one regard, though. It kind of clear, more clearly, obviously, clearly defines what the objective of the war is. The violence up to that point had just been to, to try and assert our rights, our claim to the rights of a, of a British citizen. Now, though, it's, it's pretty clear cut. We're going for independence. But, you know... Are we free yet? Is it all over? Yay, let's have fireworks. Of course not. The empire strikes back. And you could, you could hear the music, you know, dun, 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 dun. Here they come. Howe, Clinton, Cornwallis. They were forced to evacuate Boston, um, but the British put together, the big, big, at that time, the biggest expeditionary force in history. The target is going to be New York City. And Washington has figured that out. He... Uh, Everybody pretty much knows they want to control New York, get the Hudson River, cut off New England. New York at the time, second biggest city in the U.S., and had all those strategic uh, important factors to it. They're going to have a big, a big battle there in 1776. The initial engagement is going to take place out in Brooklyn Heights. So, you know, battles are like football games in a way. What's the first thing the coaches do after a football game on Sunday? Go look at the film, right? What we do good, what we do bad, and we're going to watch what the, the, bad, the enemy did or the opposition did in the last fight, and we're going to adjust for that. So, Bunker Hill, what's your lesson learned if you're an American? Don't run out of ammo, but how'd the, how'd the digging in tactics and high ground work out for you? Worked out real well. For the British, how did that frontal assault on entrenched Americans on a hilltop work out for you? <laughs> Not so good. So uh, Washington, he's got a ragtaggedy army that's really not capable of, 
maneuver on the battlefield and stuff. So what do you think he's going to do? Dig in. Dig in on Brooklyn Heights. But the Brits, these guys didn't conquer the world because they're stupid. You think they're going to go do a frontal assault on... <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get into too many of the details of the battle, but uh, essentially they faint up the middle and flank the American position, drive them out of... Uh, off of Long Island. The only smart thing Washington does in this, he takes a lot of casualties. The only smart thing he does is have a lot of uh, boats available for, to, to evacuate his troopers. They get over to Manhattan, getting some more fighting over there, get their butts kicked again, and it, it becomes like there's a series of battles around New York. It's disastrous, and Washington takes huge casualties. But he's kind of in the mode of of, a, of the general he wanted to be from his early vision. You know, he's trying to fight head to head, toe to toe with a British army, with a bunch of ragtaggedy collection of militias and uh, volunteers who have never had any military training and are under, under supplied and so forth. So it's, it's really kind of an impossible situation. He is not going to, he, he puts himself in a position to try and compete with them. And he can't even get on the same playing field, really. So around this series, after a series of battles around New York, Washington is pretty much an annihilated his army. And uh, he's forced to retreat. And this is when things get, start to get really interesting. He forces, he's forced to retreat across New Jersey. And the British and Hessians, everybody knows about the Hessians, right? German forces that were hired by the king to come over to America and fight on the behalf of the, of the British. You know, that's a big propaganda thing, too, for Americans. Like, wow, we've introduced these godless Hessians in here, and the Hessians were a nasty, nasty bunch. But the British and the Hessians are in pursuit, and uh, it's now that some British miscalculations really begin to uh, have an impact on the war effort. So I said earlier, part of our revolution, when you're the underdog like that, you need the enemy to kind of screw up. So I'd say at this point, Washington really hasn't been able to grow the movement beyond the one-third. I think most people are like, wait and see. Like, how's this going to work out? Uh, but Washington has finally figured out, I don't have the troops to compete with the British Army. Uh, he understands the character and ability of them. They're brave. They're raw. Yeah, but he's going he's to have to change, adapt and change his, his thinking to the circumstances of the war. Now, what the British do to help is they bring in the Hessians, number one. The Hessians are a, a ferocious group. They don't really differentiate between loyalist Americans, patriot Americans, and neutrals. They treat them all like crap. They are world-famous pillagers and... Uh, and, and, and and uh, steal everything that's not really tied down. Uh, one thing you have to understand about war in those days. Along the coast, the British are in good shape. The Royal Navy can keep them supplied in New York or Philadelphia. Anywhere along the coast, they're in good shape. But as soon as you start to go inland, how do you get supplied? You know, to travel in wagon trains or whatever across colonial roads is not going to be able to supply a force of four or five, six thousand guys. So what are you going to do? You're going to quarter them in people's homes. Home. Where are you going to get groceries? Go down to Publix and... Yeah, you got to send out parties to forage. And uh, foraging, uh, they send out a working party, basically. You know, you're in camp and the officer comes up and says, all right, Sergeant, I need you know, a foraging party, 12 guys, go out couple of wagon loads and grab up groceries from all the local farmers. And they'd pay him for it, but what good's money? You know, th these guys are just above subsistence farmers. You know, they're, they're growing enough for their own needs. Uh, here comes the British Army and just took, you know, your year's supply of whatever, and you're in rough shape, you and your family now. So they might give you a couple of pounds, but what are you going to do with it? You can't buy anything with it. There's no place to go for to buy groceries. So... This is New Jersey now. Remember, it's solidly neutral, solidly neutral colony, but uh, you just introduce these foraging parties in there. What's that going to do to public support for the, the patriot cause? 
Yeah. They're like, son of a... <laughs> they, just, they just cleaned out the cupboard. You know? Not only that, uh, I heard over here that they, you know, a bunch of these Hessians had stole everything that wasn't nailed down. And I wasn't even, you know, for the Patriots. And then there's also stories of rapes and stuff. So after the British go, the American, Americans start getting together and saying, all right, we're into this now. And uh, it's the growth of some militias in, in New Jersey that, that get involved in some really vicious, uh, really vicious forage wars. And again, going back to my theme that Shakespeare said, the dogs of war. Once they're out there, the Hessians and the British forces, you can't control them. You know, they're going to, especially the mentality of a European soldier was, we don't get paid that much, but when we go to war, we're allowed to pillage everything because that's kind of one of the, you know, side benefits. And, you know, it doesn't matter to them that this is a loyalist's house. So some more of the, but some more, beyond that, some more of the uh, stuff that's going to cause big, big problems for British public support. Um, one thing is they slowly pursue Washington. You know, Washington, some people say, you know, the British could have won it right there in New Jersey, but I just always counter with, I think Washington just would have retreated faster. You know, he, he understands now, I can't get in a head-to-head -head fight with these guys. They would come into towns, the British, and demand the public sign these loyalty oaths. And uh, people weren't real happy about it, because it's kind of, uh, there's a lot of, physical coercion here with people with weapons saying, sign these oaths. And the Americans signed them and uh, weren't real happy. And later the Americans would come in and they said, you, you signed those loyalty oaths? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And the Americans would say, well, that's okay. We know, you know, they, they forced you to do it. So let's just rip that up. So they came out, again, support wise, the Americans come out looking pretty good on that. Uh, one of the hugest things, and somebody we had a book back here on the uh, French and Indian War and the Native Americans up there. The British in 1777 start to make an alliance with Native Americans up in upstate New York around the Great Lakes. Uh, if you don't know much about that period of history, there's probably not a group more hated by Americans than Native Americans. So uh, English Americans, colonial Americans, and Native Americans pretty much, I mean, there were friendly tribes, but the ones that weren't friendly are feared and hated. And here, now, you have the British making an alliance with them. Now, I know you probably can't remember that slide that had the demographics, but that area up around the Mohawk River Valley in New York, that was a very, very affluent area up there, fairly heavy populated, and uh, it was all loyalist. What do you think just happened when they got word that the British are recruiting Indians? They recruiting Indians. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I'm not so loyal anymore. And it gets worse. You see that picture? I purposely threw that in there for the, the purposes of this discussion. That's, her name's Jane McCrae. And when the Indians were let loose, they just start rampaging. Again, they don't differentiate between a loyalist or a patriot. They're all just enemy Americans. And they come sweeping through the frontier. That woman there, Jane McCrae, her husband was either a major or a colonel in the loyalist militia that was off, you know, organizing and fighting with the British. And they kill his wife. <laughs> and of course, you know, his force is from the local area. The militias come from the local area. They're all, they all hear about that. And they're like, we're out of here. So... You know, another British miscalculation flips New York in, in a heartbeat. It goes from a strongly loyalist area to a cauldron of anti-British sentiment. Yeah. Well, Jane McRae had uh, red hair, and uh, uh, Indian wandered into the, into the town originally scouting for the Indians, and uh, she makes quick work of him. Yeah, I'll bet. Anyway, let loose the dogs of war. Um, and again, uh, going down the list real quickly, I know I'm kind of getting long here. Um, so much, it's so rich, you know, it's difficult to condense all this stuff. Uh, poor operational coordination, we'll see that in a minute when we talk about the 
the campaign of 1777. Uh, quartering of troops, somebody mentioned quartering. In wintertime, the, the typical thing you did in those days with your army was you quartered them in people's homes. So typically, like for instance, when uh, after, in 1776-77, the British army stayed in New York City. Where, did, where were some famous places Washington's army stayed? Valley Forge. Valley Forge, Morristown, New Jersey over the winter, out in the field. Why did they do that? I mean, armies would go take over houses. Why did the Americans stay out in the field, brave the hardships of a North American winter? It's because, you know, they... they uh, yeah, win the hearts and minds. We're not going to take over people's houses. We, we need them to support us. So you can see if we could have a timeline of the growth of the support to the American Revolution, it's taken over in New England, it's moving through New York, and uh, it's grown in New York from the Indians, and, and that it's grown in New Jersey because of the foraging and so forth. So we're getting a really, really serious movement going now. But as good as that's been going, uh, the actual reality on the ground in the fight is we're not doing too good. Washington and his army have gotten hammered around New York. At this point, getting into December 76, 1776, you know, uh, we've declared independence and everything, but in December 1776, we're down to about 2,000 men. A casualty, sickness, desertion, ending of enlistments. The entire army was going to disband at the end of 1776. So with weeks left to our army, there's really, to the Americans, there's really no hope in this cause anymore, despite the missteps of the British. And Washington is really, he has no capability other than to avoid battle. His army is simply not combat capable. If you can see in the picture, you know, this is, this is the stuff of legend, but these guys really were that raggedy. They're running around in the snow and ice, barefoot, raggedy clothes, and uh, essentially, the, the, for all intents and purposes, the war is over. The outlook for recruitment for the spring is dismal. I mean, who's going to join this cause? You know, we can't win a battle. We've got this cruddy general that never wins, and nobody thinks it's really going to survive. There is one guy, though, that, that just uh, has some emotion in this and he won't give up. Thomas Paine, he, he uh, watches the army falling apart and uh, is determined to try and do something to turn things around. And he writes this uh, pamphlet called The Crisis. I'd like to read it to you, but we're getting kind of long. But it's kind of like a super good pep talk. And... Uh, starts to arouse a little bit of the spirit of this defeated army in their camp uh, as they're waiting to f for the end of the year and to go home. But one guy that's absolutely super tenacious is war Washington himself. Pep talks are not going to win the war. But he know Washington knows, I really, this is over. Unless I can do something dramatic, we got no shot. It's over, and uh, the, the army's going to disband. I can't even begin to believe we're not all going to get arrested and hung. So he says to himself, we got to do something. And he comes up with this idea to launch a, uh, it's a preposterous attack really with the force he has. It's small, but he comes up with this preposterous idea to launch this ambitious attack in winter. You know, there's a good reason why they didn't fight in the winter back in those days. He just, he just didn't do it. The roads were impassable. The conditions were, were terrible. So why do it? But uh, this is when the education of Washington in the early stages of the war is really starting to, sh to pay off. He knows for political reasons he's got to fight a battle and he's got to win. In strategic talk, we call it, he's got to get an incremental victory. You know, there's got to be something positive. We've taken nothing but beatings and it, it's forlorn, but we got to do something. So the plan is cross the Delaware River and attack Trenton, New Jersey, where there's a regiment of Hessians. And uh, 
it's, it's brilliant in selecting the target because everybody hates Hessians. All Americans, even neutrals and loyalists, hate Hessians. So attack them. Uh, he's going to lift morale. He makes an emotional... Per he personally appeals to every soldier he's got. He only had like two, just over 2,000 left. And he goes around to the campfires and personally appeals to each one of them. And imagine, this is the richest guy in America, this southern aristocrat, getting at that personal level with with these, guys, these privates and everything. Uh, Christmas night, 1776, he makes the bold move. If this, was, if this was high stakes poker, this is all in. This is everything. That picture, it's, uh, it, people, a lot of people make, uh, make fun of it because he's standing in the boat. He, everybody probably was standing, in fact, and the ice flows, that's not, that's not mythologized there. It was horrendous conditions. It was probably more like a barge than that, than that dory, but uh, it's a pretty accurate depiction of what it was like. They get to Trenton in the morning. Everything is slow because the roads are impassable from a, the blizzard and the ice. Uh, one of the myths that we'll bust today, the Hessians, it was said that they were all drunk and sleeping and everything. Not true. They could kind of tell from activity across the river the Americans were up to something. They had their pickets out for security. They slept in uniform with their weapons loaded, and they were ready to go. But the Americans come charging into town. Uh, all together in this battle, it was only between the two sides, 3,800 soldiers engaged, about 1,800 Hessians, 2,000 Americans. So in the big course of warfare in history, it's not much more than a skirmish. But what's the effect? Morale. Absolutely. The morale, you know, we win, and we get some valuable equipment off these Hessians, but the word goes out. It, it reminded me, uh, I was re-watching some stuff on YouTube, Rocky Balboa and his first fight with uh, Apollo Creed. I don't know if you ever seen Rocky. And Rocky's taking this vicious beating for like eight rounds, and finally, in one round, he starts to fight back, and uh, Creed's looking at him at the, at the end of it, and Rocky's all beat up and bloody. He goes, I'm still standing here. <laughs> That's what it's like. He's, we're still standing there, and it's kind of like the crisis has been overcome. The crisis is overcome. The army is small, but when the spring rolls around, guys get their crops in, they start to enlist again. Uh, after Trenton, there's another surprise victory around, around Princeton where the Americans grab up a lot of supplies and then they hightail it over to, uh, to Morristown, New Jersey. Again, the British winter in Philadelphia and New York. Washington's out in the field. But uh, Washington's you now develop an advanced tactics to really put the British on the horns of a dilemma. He's got militia groups in, in New Jersey now. They're just fierce out there attacking British foraging parties. And, he's, and Washington's got his main army. So the British have this dilemma. I gotta do something about these foraging, you know, these, these militia groups that are killing my foraging parties. So that would require me to kind of break down my main force to chase after them. But if I do that, Washington's main force can kind of compete with my reduced size. So, the, what do you do if you're the British? If you, if you chase after the militias, you're making yourself vulnerable. If you stay in a consolidated army, the militias are killing your, your foraging groups. So it's, a, it's quite a dilemma, and it, it really kind of keeps everything uh, in a positive way for, for, of course, Washington and the Americans. Now we're into 1777. Uh, British strategy, control the Hudson River Valley. As you can see in the arrows, uh, north and south. Burgoyne's going to move down from Montreal. He's got 8,000 guys. There's uh, pro-British Tories and Indians that are coming from the west. That's the Indian force. And, of course, as I already alluded to, the Indians are going to have a devastating impact on the Loyalist support there. Howe, General Howe, is supposed to move up from New York upriver, and they're all supposed to meet around Albany. But... 
you know, how, how good are communications back in the day? So how decides to modify the plan? And this is one of those miscalculations that was on the slide of lack of good strategic coordination. How decides, and this is another misinterpretation of the war, another screw up, he decides, I'm gonna go capture Philadelphia. Do you Americans care if he captures Philadelphia? I mean, it's what we're using as the capital, but they just go someplace else. It doesn't matter to us a geographic location, but how's thinking like an, a European general? Oh, if I capture their capital, that'll be a big deal. The Americans don't care. As long as Washington's in the field and the government runs away, the cause is still going. So uh, already, with how leaving, one third of the force in the plan is already pretty screwed up. Uh, keep in mind, uh, it's, it's campaigning season in the Northeast, it's rainy spring, and it's, it's pretty tough for Burgoyne coming down from Montreal through that part. It's pretty much wilderness up there. So his force is moving through the woods late May, early June, and they're still, it's still on the move by September. And that's pretty rough on an army back in the day. There's not, not many farms or anything to forage up there, so the health of his army and everything is, is declining, and, uh, so he, and he's been pretty much on his own. Howe is not coming to help, and he doesn't know that. And this force out here to the west, under St. Laguerre, the Indian force, a famous American general named Benedict Arnold goes out there with a force and, and kicks their butt, and they kind of disperse. So essentially, uh, the strategy for 1777 is falling apart, and Burgoyne's uh, still out there all on his own. So by midsummer, he's in trouble. No logistic support, his health, his army's declining. He's got militia guys now that have been alienated by the Indian activity, attriting his forces, and they get involved in a battle at Saratoga, New York, which uh, is, a, is a huge American victory. And what are some other results gonna be of this, of this battle? First of all, morale of the American people is just like, holy cow, this is not just a little regiment of Hessians, this is a British army it has surrendered and it has been eliminated. Uh, so morale is boosted. The Northern strategy for the entire year abandoned it with all that expense and now the war is gonna go on, which is, which is uh, bad for the Brits. We, yeah, and, uh, but the big thing you always think about with, the, with the Saratoga is France enters the war. It's gonna enter the war as our ally. What's that going to do for us? It's just a lot more troops. A lot more troops, but they're not going to arrive for quite a while. Yeah, but we're not going to really get any much help from them until 1781. Financial support right away. Money, Money some weapons, that kind of stuff. The most important, uh, again, the French military assistance is not really decisive till 1780, 81. Uh, but what else does it do to the nature of the war? What was the war? It starts a war in British Pardon me? It starts a war in British Yeah, a little bit. You just went from their arch enemy, who's 20 something miles across a little channel, that outnumbers them by a lot, uh, who's still pissed off from losing all their colonies and stuff in the, in the uh, Seven Years' War, is now at war with them. It just went from hey, let's suppress this little revolution in North America. It went from that to a global war. Oh, India's threatened. The Caribbean's threatened. The homeland is threatened. The first thing the French do is move, uh, I think, a huge force. I think it was 85,000 or something men up towards Patacale. That's an invasion force if they can get the naval power to get across. So the Brits are like, whoa. This changed everything. It's not just a, a minor little thing that they might send some troopers over here. Great Britain, homeland itself, is under threat. So uh, the war has changed. It's, it's gone from a little suppression of a rebellion to a global war. In America, situa strategic situation in winter of 1777, well, we're still hanging in there. Uh, 
starts to, bre- to beg the, the question at this point, again, of a revolutionary leader, Washington. Is he a great general? Uh, he gets beat all the time. Uh, so, what's, you know, how should we think of him? Is he, he's a brilliant tactician. Uh, probably, you got to understand, this is part of his brilliance, his adaptability. He's, he's so flexible because he understands, I can't fight these guys toe-to-toe. I just got to keep this thing going. I got to make this so, thing so costly for them. So, yeah, he would fight battles, and he would lose them, but he never, you know, Think of it, in the 17th and 18th century European wars, they would have like a single battle that was decisive and that was the end of the war. Washington would never let that happen. He's going to avoid a culminating battle, a decisive battle at all costs. He's going to fight you. He's going to hurt you. He's going to put himself in an advantageous position. He'll take casualties, but after New York, he learned, don't go toe-to-toe with these guys. Put yourself in a position to hurt them and escape. And that's, that becomes his tactics. So yeah, he doesn't win a lot of battles, but this is a tactic that is potentially going to be a war winner. At Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, an interesting thing happens. This guy shows up. That nobody ever heard of him. He says, I'm a baron. I'm Baron von Steuben. Uh, and he was from the Prussian Army. Nobody knows if he's a baron or if he was a drill instructor from the Prussian Army. But... Uh, he comes in and convinces Washington to let him train up American troops. And he's a brilliant trainer. And the core elements of the American army, about two or 3,000 guys at Valley Forge, get trained up over the winter by an advanced tactician. And it makes these guys the most, some of the most capable soldiers in the world through training. And what happens is in the spring when the army comes back, all the reenlistments and stuff, and the army swells in size again, up to its probably 15 to 20,000 man size. Those 3,000 are dispersed throughout the force and become like the, you know, the platoon sergeants or the company commanders. So you've just gone, and they, they train these guys up. So you've just gone from a ragtag of the army that couldn't compete in the field with the British army. You got from that to a really capable advanced force that can maneuver on the battlefield under fire and do anything that the British or Hessians can do. Do the British know that? Yeah. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> they think, yeah, let's just try and draw these guys out into a fight again. We can smack them around anytime we want. And they meet in, and the Americans are dying to fight them now. Washington finally has a force he can compete with. And uh, so they kind of trail the uh, British on a movement from Philadelphia to New York. And they get in a fight at Monmouth, New Jersey. And uh, it's it's really cool story about the Battle of Monmouth, but the one uh, takeaway from it is the Americans fight the British all day long, toe to toe. They say nobody wins, but the British would draw at the end of the day. So I call that a win. So, you know, again, Battles are like football games. What's the lesson learned for the Americans? We can do it. These tactics work. You know, if we had done this instead of that, you know, we would have really had some success. What did the British learn? We can lose. Yeah, they're probably back there at camp going, who were those guys? <laughs> Where did they come from? So uh, the British Army keeps moving and gets to New York, and they're like, we're done. We're, uh, you know, we can't go out there and fight these guys. And one of the things I, me- I forgot to mention as far as the global war with France going on now, one of the uh, strategic outcomes was the British government tells the commanders in America, oh, by the way, we're worried about homeland defense, so you're not getting any more troops. This is it. Uh, so now, because of this Battle of Monmouth, the British decide- realize we don't have enough troops to beat these guys. We need more. And they're calling for reinforcements, and the, the government says, you ain't getting any. We're worried about homeland defense now. And uh, so they have to come up with a plan. They've got to grow their force now. So they come up with a, pri- a strategy for 79 to 81. So it, they're going to maintain their defensive in the northern colonies, specifically hang on in New York. And they're going to go on the offensive with an army in the southern colonies. 
because they think, and they're right, there's a lot of loyalists in the southern colonies. But, uh, you know, it's one thing to be a loyalist. It's another thing to say, yes, I will join an army and march 500 miles away from my home and risk life and limb. Uh, so they, they put this thing together. They take the army down to uh, the south. They invade Charleston. They start rampaging around through the countryside. What do you think is going to happen based on the experience of New, New Jersey? No, it's, how, where are they getting the groceries? Now, this was a loyalist area for the most part. There was a lot of loyalists in the South, but now you're foraging from them. Now you're treating loyalists uh, like uh, Tories are, are being treated the same way as patriots, and it just starts to go bad. Uh, one of the things that really comes out now, too, because the British probably pretty frustrated with the situation, there's a lot of atrocities. A famous character, Bannister Tarleton, there was a thing called Tarleton's Quarter, where in engagements, if they won small unit actions, they never took prisoners. They'd, they'd kill everybody. So the atrocities uh, being broadcast around turns the, uh, the British uh, loyalty into patriot loyalty in the South in pretty short order. Uh, by 1780, the Americans are doing pretty good. General Nathaniel Green's down there. He's adopted the same tactics that Washington uses of fight, retreat, fight, retreat, inflict casualties. Uh, by the end of September, or the summer of 1781, General Cornwallis and the British are in pretty bad shape and are forced to uh, withdraw to Yorktown, Virginia. And now the, uh, the French army is on the scene. Washington and his, and the French army and the American army are up around New York but they get word that the British are withdrawn to, the uh, British Southern forces were drawn to Yorktown, and Washington realizes this is a strategic opportunity. He coordinates with the French fleet that's down in the Caribbean. There's another French naval force in Newport, Rhode Island with siege guns. And combining his and the French army, they move down to Yorktown. So they got this three-pronged uh, attack goes off like smooth as silk, unbelievable with the communications of that era. And uh, the key piece of this is everything's fallen into place, is the Battle of the Virginia Capes. You know, the entire history of conflict between Great Britain and France. I don't know of any other significant victories the French fleet ever had against the British. But the one time, the one time they have some success is off the coast of Virginia in this battle in September 1781. Excuse me. And what that does is isolate Cornwallis's force in Yorktown. He, can't, he was waiting for rescue, basically, from the French fleet to take him out of there, and now he's marooned. So with, uh, he's surrounded by British and French uh, land forces. He's cut off from the sea. And after uh, some sharp battles in and around Yorktown, the British surrender October 19th, 1781. Could the British have kept going? Yeah. Sure. British could have kept fighting. They had plenty of reasons. The wealthiest nation on, er on earth, plenty of manpower. They got Hessians. They could pay them to forever. But uh, a, a, an important quote from Clausewitz War is not an act of senseless passion. In other words, we're pissed off, we just got beat, we're gonna fight back because we won't give up. No, it, it, it's gotta be controlled by the value of the object. And at this stage, even if they could mount some kind of military successes, do you think America would have been governable? No, no. no. You're, not, you're not ever gonna be able to come back now and repair all that and have loyal subjects. This is going to be a festering problem forever if you try and control it. So the British make the common sense decision to give up. Now, takeaways, and then we'll do a contrast with some other groups. But uh, So again, America, the American Revolution is kind of a well-considered enterprise, small group of ambitious men. They took actions to provoke strong reactions. So if you're a revolutionary at the beginning, you gotta be willing to take a beating. 
because you're going to take a beating, but you're going to become martyrs. A, a revolutionary movement needs martyrs, and that's what the uh, Sons of Liberty became in the initial movement there. You've got to control information operations and propaganda. You're going to have to grow your movement, so you're going to have to do things to make you popular. Uh, even though our forces were inferior, we used some very, very innovative tactics, like the coordination of militias and, and conventional forces that hadn't been done before. Um, you, need, you need some help, and the British helped us. Military complacency, their strategic missteps was a big assist. But Washington's, uh, in this particular case, Washington's ability, his adaptability is extraordinary, and that really is, is a key to winning the, winning the war. So eventually the British conclude that it's not going to work out. So comparables. I said, this is a template for a successful revolution. So I thought, I'll compare him to Al-Qaeda. We all know Al-Qaeda, 9-11 and all that stuff. Uh, you can almost compare, theoretically, the Sons of Liberty, who were a vicious group of nasty son of a guns, to the knuckleheads that... Uh, flew planes into the World Trade Center. Because what were they trying to accomplish? They want a big overreaction by the American government. So when we come in there and do what we're going to do and hammer somebody in the Muslim world, they're going to create martyrs. They're going to create sympathy for their cause. So yeah, they do this atrocious, ugly act and kill everybody on 9-11, but their hope is we do something that's going to create martyrs and create sympathy for their cause. Did they get the, did Al-Qaeda get the desired reaction? They'd say, yeah. We invaded Afghanistan. Excuse me. They, uh, we did the Iraqi freedom operation in uh, 2003, I guess it was. And now they've got their propaganda arm uh, what's it called, uh, Al Jazeera, running around taking pictures of Muslim fighters getting killed. They're, they're now gone from a little Al-Qaeda group of some nuts that flew planes into uh, skyscrapers, and now they've got a serious support for this movement. And these guys, you know, they, they, these are from wealthy areas. These are not like starving uh, Arabs out in the desert or something. These are relatively affluent people too, just like Americans were in the 1770s. They've got no economic grievance. They've got their own policies that they want to implement, but the fact is they do get the American reaction. Or some, pe some people might say overreaction. But there's a lot of violence, and the dogs of war are let loose, and their cause is starting to benefit from it. It kind of goes sideways for a while, but by 2010, under President Obama, the country, America's tired of it. Don't want to do this anymore. So we leave. We leave uh, Iraq and kind of stumble through more years in uh, Afghanistan. But uh, we contribute to their cause by some stupid miscalculations. Leaving at that stage in 2010, how's that going to work out for us? We could have a separate lecture on that, but... What, what, what's kind of a direct result of American departure from Iraq in 2010? Everything we built up went away. Everything we built up went away. How, what's that do for the Al-Qaeda? Yeah, they, they're getting momentum now. They're kind of viewing it like, we're winning. They left. And what, what, what grows out of that? Anybody remember ISIS? Yep. That's a direct result of American departure from, that, from the region. Now they're doing real good. <laughs> I mean, think about it. They started out with a handful of guys with knife cutters. Now they've got a real no kidding little force out there taking over parts of Syria and Iraq. Very opp opportunistic. But here's, I think, uh, where they went wrong. You know, when Washington was growing his movement, how did he treat the people in general? Did he quarter in their, in their houses? To the extent that he could, he avoided foraging. A lot of times they would actually, in the forage wars, American army lived on forage, 
that the British had taken, that we then killed their parties and took, took the food. But whatever, the American force endured enormous hardship to not lose that public support. How did ISIS do? That's, I think, with its, the, their movement really kind of disconnected. Remember some of the atrocities? It became very uh, public. I remember uh, all the beheadings, mass shootings, and I remember they captured a Jordanian helicopter pilot and had him in a cage and doused him with gas and put him on fire. Uh, I think, you know, they lost, they lost the information operations side of it. They lost the ability to propagandize and, and make themselves sympathetic. They started to look like vicious, just vicious killers. And, and their movement fell apart. I, I think if they had continued on the track that they were on, instead of killing all those people, they started doing some smart things like building a medical clinic in their communities or whatever. It would have it would have gone a whole lot, a lot differently for them. And, and uh, who knows where we'd be right now. So they kind of doomed their own movement over time. And then, of course, when President Trump came in, he didn't get too personally involved. He called up General Mattis, who was the first Secretary of Defense under Trump, and said, uh, General Mattis, would you take care of this problem for me? And Mattis said, yeah, we know how to do it. We can do that. Because ISIS was the terrorist basically out of the, out in, out in the world, and uh, they make pretty good targets. They make pretty good targets. So it didn't take them long in the American military, but really using indigenous forces over there, the Iraqis, uh, we pretty much wiped out, well, ISIS was wiped out during the Trump administration. So that's pretty much uh, the connection to, you could, you could draw connections to any revolution from ours and how they behave, that's just one. Uh, lately I've heard they, they think we, we need to cancel George Washington, so uh, a plea from, uh, from me. To me, uh, George Washington's you know, if I think of all of human history, what I know about history, I put George Washington as a, a top five human being of all time. He's, he's up there with, with the greatest. And uh, the rest of his life, even after the war, does nothing but to distinguish him even more. Anybody have any questions? Everybody good? Thank you, gentlemen.